a fight broke out in Cincinnati on the night of September 17, 1992. It wasn't terribly violent. Nobody was seriously injured, and if there hadn't been witnesses, it's likely that no one would have known it had happened in the first place. It didn't last very long either, being broken up within seconds. No, this fight wouldn't have made news at all if it weren't for the pair at the center of the scuffle. Unlike most brawls in baseball, this one happened to involve two men wearing the same uniform in the team's clubhouse, in front of teammates, reporters, and television cameras. When the headlines were written the next morning, not many were surprised to read that Rob Dibble had been involved. After all, in the early 90s, there were few people in baseball with a shorter temper than Rob Dibble. Unfortunately for Rob, one of those few happened to be his own manager. From the time he entered the league as a player in 1964, Lou Pinella had cultivated a reputation for himself as one of the most fiery figures in the history of the game. So it didn't take a genius to figure out that forcing two of the biggest hotheads in the sport to share a clubhouse for 162 games a year might result in some friction. But nobody was expecting this. Before I continue, I just want to give a quick shout out to the sponsor of today's video, DraftKings. The baseball season is in full swing. We've already seen several no-hitters, and even more exciting walk-off finishes. And now, DraftKings Sportsbook is giving all new customers a shot at turning $5 into $150 in free bets with 30 to 1 odds on any baseball team. No matter if your team wins or loses, new customers will earn $150 in free bets if their first wager with DraftKings is $5 or more on baseball. And if Sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, you can still feel the thrill of baseball season with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Contests. DraftKings will have millions of dollars in total prizes up for grabs every week of the season. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now, use the promo code HISTORIAN, throw down just $5 on the baseball team of your choosing, and get $150 in free bets no matter what. That's code HISTORIAN at DraftKings Sportsbook. The 1990 Reds were a powerhouse. With a lineup that boasted players like Barry Larkin, Billy Hatcher, and Eric Davis, they had spent the better part of the previous decade coming to grips with the idea that, try as they might, the glory days of the 1970s Big Red Machine were long gone. What they got instead, however, was one of the most exciting, volatile, and successful teams the franchise had ever seen. On opening day of 1990, the Reds rallied in the 11th inning to beat the Houston Astros 8-4. This win placed them at the top of the National League West with a record of 1-0. They won again the next day, this time in a 3-2 squeaker. They'd rattle off seven more wins before they were handed their first loss, a 1-3 nail-biter versus the Braves. They finished April 13-3, at which point they were already four and a half games up on the second place Dodgers. As it turns out, they wouldn't give up that spot for the rest of 1990, becoming the first team in National League history to lead their division from game one to the final day of the season. All this wouldn't have been possible without a trio of pitchers that made up the heart of the Reds' bullpen. From the seventh inning onward, Reds games belonged to Randy Myers, Norm Charlton, and Rob Dibble. You might know them as the Nasty Boys. For a group with a name better suited for a boy band than a baseball team, the Nasty Boys could do no wrong in Cincinnati, at least for one wild season. They accumulated a combined 349 innings that season, with Norm and Rob each striking out over 100 batters and Randy finishing them off en route to 31 saves. But it was in the postseason that they really earned their nickname. Over the course of the six-game National League Championship Series, the trio led up a grand total of one run against the Pittsburgh Pirates. They followed that performance up with eight and two-thirds shutout innings against an Oakland lineup that included sluggers Jose Canseco and Mark McGuire, batting leader Walt Weiss, and future Hall of Famer and all-around run-scoring machine Ricky Henderson. Prior to the series, many onlookers had speculated that the Oakland Athletics were on their way to becoming a baseball dynasty. The Reds swept them in four games. Let's take a closer look at the Nasty Boys, shall we? First up, we've got Norm Charlton. Probably best known for intentionally running over Dodgers catcher Mike Sosha during a nationally televised game, Charlton had opened up the season in the pen before being moved to the rotation halfway through. By the postseason, though, Charlton had returned to his spot as the Reds' seventh inning guy. Next up is Randy Myers. Traded to the Reds that year for closer John Franco, Myers had quickly established himself as being among the league's most elite, posting an ERA of 208 over 66 games played. He was also selected to his first All-Star team that season, one of six Reds to achieve the honor. One of those six was Rob Dibble, the eighth inning man, and by far the most, let's call it, high strung. At 26 years old, Dibble possessed one of the hardest fastballs in the league, and he wasn't afraid to let others know it. 
It wasn't uncommon to see Dibble brush the occasional batter back, or, as was often the case, hit him, for something as simple as standing a little too close to the plate. He had been suspended multiple times in 1989. The first was in May, when he threw a bat against the backstop screen after giving up a run to Terry Pendleton. The second instance occurred right before the All-Star break, when he nailed Mets second baseman Tim Tuffle in the back with a pitch. Tuffle charged Dibble, causing a bench-clearing brawl that left Rob suspended for three more games. As a matter of fact, actually, Dibble wasn't really afraid to throw at non-batters either. After one especially bad game in April of 1991, Dibble performed what would later come to be known as a Trevor Bauer, hurling a ball 400 feet into the centerfield bleachers. The throw struck a woman sitting in the stands, sending her to the hospital and sending Dibble to the bench for another four games. During another game later that season, Dibble responded to a squeeze attempt by Chicago outfielder Doug Descenzo by throwing the baseball directly at his back as he ran up the first baseline. It was brazenly intentional, and he was ejected immediately. Now, if anybody out there is confused by this play, which, to be fair, is understandable, given that Major League Baseball doesn't operate under the same rules as a backyard wiffle ball game, all they need to remember is that Rob Dibble wasn't playing to make sense. He was playing to win games and hurt people. Some of the more generous fans called him passionate. Many others called him a d For better or worse, however, this ever-present threat of bodily harm made him one of the most effective pitchers in the league, so long as he could keep himself on the field. On the other end of the bench was Lou Pinella. A 20-year MOB veteran, Pinella had split his playing days between the Royals and the Yankees, taking home the 1969 Rookie of the Year award, a 1972 All-Star selection, and a pair of World Series titles in 77 and 78. He was never the best player on his team, especially when those teams included legends of the game, like Reggie Jackson, Thurman Munson, and Dave Winfield. Nevertheless, he had a knack for endearing himself to fans, in large part thanks to his borderline obsessive passion for the game, an intensity that earned him the tongue-in-cheek nickname, Sweet Lou. He had played more than a few seasons under skipper Billy Martin, whose own quick temper often resulted in him being unceremoniously thrown out of town, only to be brought back for another go-round a few months later. And while I'm not saying Martin was responsible for Lou's hot-headedness, let's just say the pair had more in common than not. As a manager, Lou liked players who he considered to be like him, fiery, intense, and willing to back those feelings up on the field. For Lou, a lack of outward emotion from his players was often seen as not caring. I hated to lose as a player, he was once quoted as saying. As a manager, I hated even more. As a player, Lou Pinella broke bats, slammed helmets, shattered lights, and abused more than his fair share of water coolers. As a manager, he kicked dirt and threw bases. Of course, you probably knew that, considering his name regularly makes an appearance whenever people bring up the greatest manager tantrums of all time. He was, in a way, the perfect person to lead this group. Most baseball fans were expecting a repeat performance for the Cincinnati Reds in 1991, as they entered the season featuring much the same roster as they had the year before. By season's end, however, what had begun as a sequel to one of the most incredible runs in franchise history had turned into a fourth place finish in the NL West, as the floundering club managed only 74 wins. This was a problem, especially for Lou Pinella and Rob Dibble. See, winning is a lot like Greece. It helps the parts of a machine work together, and when applied to areas in need, can serve as a way to keep an otherwise volatile operation running pretty smoothly. Losing, in its own way, is also a lot like Greece. It tastes like shit. Tensions in the Reds clubhouse had predictably started to rise, and by September of 1992 had reached a near fever pitch. It had been a month and a half since the Reds had last occupied first place in the NL West, and at ten and a half games back of the Braves, they had been virtually eliminated from postseason contention. That's not to say that there wasn't going to be drama. It was a Thursday night in Cincinnati. Through seven innings, the Reds held a narrow 3-2 advantage over the visiting Braves. Now, this was typically the kind of situation where Pinello would have gone to Dibble to hold the lead. He'd been reliable. The last time he had let up so much as a single run had been an August outing versus the Mets. And he was well rested, having last made an appearance two days earlier. Instead, Lou Pinello used a total of four relievers over two innings to close out the game, and the Reds were able to hold onto the lead without Dibble. This, as you might imagine, didn't go over well with Rob. Pinella, for his part, was asked by the press why he didn't bring his all-star closer into the game, even when the Braves had put the tying and winning runs on third and second base, with one out in the ninth. His answer would not only change the course of the Reds' already disappointing season, but it, in all likelihood, set in motion a series of events that would see the end of both men's time in Cincinnati. Lou said that he hadn't used Dibble because the pitcher had been nursing a sore shoulder, and was physically unable to pitch. 
This wasn't completely unbelievable, considering Dibble had spent the previous offseason undergoing treatment for that very same right shoulder. But on this particular night, at least according to Dibble, his shoulder wasn't sore. But his ego sure was. When reporters questioned him about Pinella's statement, Rob may or may not have directly implied that his manager was a liar. For a guy like Lou, being called a liar was an insult on the same order of magnitude as an actual slap in the face. So when word got back to him about this accusation, he responded accordingly. To put this matchup into perspective, Dibble was a 6 foot 4, 230 pound ball of anger in human form. Lou, meanwhile, was 20 years older, 4 inches shorter, and about 40 pounds lighter. So while I wouldn't take my chances in a fight against the man, Rob met Lou head on, placing him in a headlock and dragging the 49 year old to the clubhouse floor. A few calm, well articulated arguments followed. And the thriller with Pinella, as it would come to be known, was over almost as soon as it began. With his own team holding him back, which, given how the preceding fight had just played out, was probably in his best interest, Lou hurled one last insult at Dibble. You don't want to be treated like a man! Before turning his attention to the camera. And that's where the footage ends. The fallout was almost immediate. The pair was sent to the principal's, I mean, owner's office, the next day. Red's owner, Marge Schott, who quite honestly was worse than both Penella and Dibble, but that's a story for another day, forced the pair to make up, and more importantly, reassured the media that the scuffle was all due to a simple misunderstanding. Penella would go on to use Dibble in each of the team's next two games, and Dibble would earn the save in both, allowing only one hit and striking out four. The Reds would finish the season second in the NL West, with a respectable record of 90-72. Their home game attendance ranked 4th in the league, at 2.3 million fans. All this didn't stop the club from letting Lou Pinella go that offseason, and just like that, the hot-blooded manager was run out of town less than two years removed from winning it all. Dibble would play out the rest of his contract with Cincinnati, but he was hampered by arm problems throughout much of the 93 season, and the Reds, mercifully, let him walk. The Cincinnati Reds of the early 90s will be forever known as one of the biggest what-ifs in baseball history. In the span of three seasons, they went from underdogs, to frontrunners, to a cautionary tale about the dangers of high expectations, ego, and, to put it bluntly, forcing two people who probably never should have interacted into the same dugout on a nightly basis. But regardless of whether or not this infamous clubhouse fight should have happened in the first place, the fact remains that it did, and baseball, in my humble opinion, is all the more interesting for it. <laughs>